as a basis for Dwight's sermon. It's my privilege to read from Philippians chapter 4, a series of familiar verses 4 through 13. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content. I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry. I can also be content whether living in plenty or in want, because I can do everything through him who gives me strength. little tune in your brain. Don't worry, be happy. In every life we have some trouble, but when you worry, you make it double. Not a scripture passage, but something to think about. I am, by nature, a pretty easygoing guy. I like to take life as it comes, I try not to get too high, I try not to get too low. But I do have this thing about me. I can tend to worry. And I have my share of anxious thoughts. In 2005, I think it was, I awoke one night in a state of panic. My heart was racing, my arm was tingling. I wasn't sure what to do. The kids were sleeping, Jenny was working night shift, and so that really did not help matters at all. What was going on? Was I actually having a heart attack? I tried to calm myself down but the symptoms persisted. Finally, I called Jenny at work, which is something I never do in the middle of the night. We had a conversation, I tried to calm down, and we finally decided that she would come home and take me to the emergency room. 
They did a bunch of tests. They sent me home because they didn't find anything. Scheduled a st stress test for a couple weeks later. Again, came back negative. So what was wrong? Self-diagnosis. It was an anxiety attack. Stress. Anxiety and stress can make our bodies do things like think we're having a heart attack. It gets the best of us. Our mind starts playing games. Even though there is really nothing wrong. We live in a culture of high stress, high anxiety. And it's not just adults. It's children and youth as well. As a youth pastor, I'm becoming more and more aware of youth being under anxiety. So I ask you, what causes you anxiety? Job? Marriage? School? Sports? Bills? Children? Parents? Church? Hopefully you did not say yes to all of these. But there are many areas in our life that can cause us to have stress or to have anxiety, to worry. We feel the pressure to succeed. Children, youth, feel the pressure to do well in school, feel the pressure to do well in sports. Our children are involved in so many activities. We're running here, we're running there. We say hi to our spouse as we go in and out of the door. We have this desire, as they say, to keep up with the Joneses. We want what other people have. All of these things contribute to our anxiety. What are we to do? We turn to the scripture, and I think our scripture passage this morning, we can provide four ways to calm or avoid our anxiety, our worries, and our stress. So let's look at Philippians 4. First, in verse 4, Paul tells us to rejoice in the Lord, and again, he says rejoice. Do you get the impression that Paul wants us to rejoice? By rejoicing, we exalt or we recognize God's glory. When we rejoice in the Lord, we take the focus off ourselves and we put it on God. The psalmist says, I will be glad and rejoice in your love for you saw my affliction and knew the anguish of my soul. The psalm rejoices because he is aware of God's love for him and he knows that God knows the anguish which he is in. God does love and care for us. 1 Peter 5, 7 tells us to cast all our anxiety upon him, meaning God, because he cares for us. God knows and understands our anguish of our soul. What causes you to worry? Rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say, rejoice. I think Paul would say or sing, don't worry, be rejoicing. The second way is to pray. Do not be anxious about anything, seems harsh, until you read the but in verse 6. But in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Eugene Peterson in the message says it this way. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worry, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. I like that thought of prayer shaping our worries into prayers. 
prayers, shaping our worries, and letting God know our concerns. Many times our worries are focused on things that cannot, we cannot change or will not even happen. We have this little thought of what if, and suddenly our minds are racing with all the what ifs that could happen. And yet many of them never materialize. In fact, researchers at University of Cincinnati found that 85% of what you worry about never happens. 85% of what we worry about never happens. When I am preparing to take the youth on a trip such as Phoenix or to creation, I need to be careful that I don't allow the what ifs worries to get to me. Like what if 25 of us miss a flight? What if I forgot to buy someone a ticket? What if someone gets sick or injured? What if, what if? We need to take our what ifs and turn them into prayers and petitions, making God aware of our concerns. One morning this week, I had to put into practice what I was going to preach. I awoke at 4.30 a.m. My mind began to race, mostly about preparing this sermon, but I had other things to do as well this week. And so the what ifs started happening. I turned those worries into prayers. And suddenly my alarm was going off. I had fallen back to sleep. I invite you to turn your worries into prayers. Because Paul would also sing, don't worry, be praying. Third, we need to be renewed. We need to think with a renewed mind. In verse 8, Paul says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. When we worry or have anxiety, I think we tend to focus on the opposite of these things. And this is what our culture constantly feeds us. Our culture does not think about what is true, noble, excellent, uh, lovely, pure. It thinks on the opposite of those. And so we read in Romans 12 too, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The pattern of this world is the opposite of all these things that Paul has given us to think about. We need to have our renewed mind to think about such things. Our culture tells us what? That truth is anything we want it to be. What's good for me is okay for me. What's good for you is okay for you. But Jesus says in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We, Paul invites us to think about what is true. Truth comes from Christ. We are to think about what is pure. We live in a world that doesn't know what pure is. All you need to do is watch movies, watch television. Listen to these words from Titus. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by the actions, their actions, they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for doing anything good. Harsh words for the unpure. And Paul, in his letter to Timothy, said something similar when we read, 
Flee the evil desires of your youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. To think pure thoughts, we need to have a pure heart. We need to have thoughts of righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Do not let the pattern of this world fill our minds and dictate what we think about. Instead, we need to think with our renewed minds. Don't worry, be renewed. Fourth, we need to be content. In verse 12, Paul says he has learned to be content whether he is in need or he has plenty. Are you content? Many of us here this morning have plenty, more than we need. But are we content? We find ourselves wanting more. But we need to rely on God because he is the one who supplies our needs. On the many youth mission trips that I have taken our youth on, they almost always comment how happy the people are even though they seem to have much less than us. They seem to be content. I wonder if in some ways it's not easier to be content with less than with more. In Matthew chapter six, which Marcy referred to in her children's story, Jesus has these words for us. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble on its own. Do not worry. Seek God's kingdom. Be content. God knows what you need, and he will supply it. Three times in this short section of verses, Jesus tells his disciples, he tells us, do not worry. Like Paul, we are in need. Or if we have plenty, we need not to worry. We can be content when we trust God. Don't worry, be content. Four ways to avoid worry and anxiety. Don't worry, be rejoicing. Don't worry, be praying. Don't worry, think with a renewed mind. Don't worry, be content. What is the result of this? What do we gain? I believe it is the peace of God. It is the peace that passes all understanding. It is the peace that Jesus gave his disciples when they were gathered in the room with the doors locked because of their fear of the Jews. I'm guessing the disciples had a heightened worry. Their anxiety was at a new level. But what happens? Jesus enters the room, the locked room, and he says, peace be with you. He then shows them his hands and his sides. And again, he says, peace be with you. Breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. I am convinced that as Jesus followers, he wants us to experience the peace of God. In our passage this morning, Paul says, the Lord is near. Jesus is near. 
He never leaves us nor forsakes us. He is ready to enter your locked room filled with anxiety and worry and he says to you, peace be with you. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.